Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Real Quick with Mike Swick podcast, special quarantine series, episode number six. Today, we have a very good guest, uh, a little nervous. He's a podcast professional. This is the, the best podcaster I've ever had on my podcast, so I'm sure it's going to be uh, interesting. I'm going to try to keep up and look as professional as I can. Uh, he's not only a podcaster, but he's the legend of the sport, a true OG, uh, someone who was a UFC champion and who actually knocked out arguably one of the best fighters of all time in George St. Pierre. I'm talking about Matt Serra. Matt Serra, welcome to the show, buddy. Mike Swick, man, it's been a minute, like the kids it's, say. That means a yeah. long time, though. It's long been a while, time. man. Yeah, I know, man. Are you, dude? You're in Thailand? Are you Phuket. in Thailand now? Yeah, I'm in Phuket. Now, you Crazy. have uh, uh, the, uh, uh, um, is it an AKA Thailand or how, what is it? AKA Thailand, yep. So it's man, I almost want to. I know I'm on your show, but I almost want to flip it and find out how you went out there and everything. Yeah, I'll come on. I mean, man. No, you got to understand. Oh yeah, you got to come on mine too, man. Because I'm just well, we'll bullshit now too. But I mean, I remember we fought on the same card several times, probably. Yeah, no? and there's there's one real significant one I got to talk to you about that, that's that's uh, real meaningful to me. But and we'll get into that in a second. Cool. Um, but sure, uh, man. yeah, yeah, man, I got I built this gym out here for like ten years. Uh, it's a big gym. It's like a it's kind of like a college campus of fighting, man. We got like a restaurant. We got multiple facilities for like outdoor Muay Thai area. We got an indoor MMA area upstairs, downstairs weight room, uh, airdyne room. We got a basketball court. We're building a whole new thing in the back. So it's it's kind of cool, man. It'd be, it'd be great to have you out. So hopefully I can get you out here and uh, hey, maybe you can come out and see it. Hey, dude, I would love to, man. Maybe do a seminar or something or even just, you know, just to pay for the trip. But I'll tell you, one thing we do have in common, Mike, is uh, it seems is with our fighting, uh, at least with myself, like I made my my retirement plans was my jujitsu academies. Like I've been right. teaching before I have a fought. And I was teaching for 20 years on Long Island. I plan on teaching for another 20. I put a lot of my, I got some decent purses towards the end of my career. And I put them like right into my schools because, you know, the old saying, if you like to do what you do uh, for a job, you never have to work a day in your life. And dude, my academies are, are good times, man. I'm living the dream up until recently. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I feel you, man. I had to shut my gym down. And unlike in America, man, it's like, we have very strict uh, mandates. And so it's like, and I agree with them. Like, I fully agree with them. We're looking at America, man. And we're just like, what the fuck is going on? Because like, it's spreading so fast and it's getting worse every day. And it seems like there's more and more stories of like Americans not paying attention, not caring, not not believing it, uh, you know, staying in groups. And like, we can't even leave our house unless we're going to the store or to like, in a, like have a really good reason. Uh, it, we can't get caught outside our house without a mask on or it's like $600 fine. Uh, we got police checkpoints that have completely enclosed all our areas. So it's like, it's like districts, man. It's not even like cities. It's like districts. Like where I live is like the small, like Cotta beach area, um, near Cotta beach area. And it's like that area is completely blocked off. So I can't even go to like eight minutes away to my gym or eight minutes away to my bank. Uh, so it's like we're having to do like checkpoints. So when I do this podcast and get all this this, this footage and all these videos and audios and, and stuff, I'm doing this all myself. I have to now take this USB stick tomorrow and go to the checkpoint with the with the military and the police, meet my staff, give them the the USB, and then he takes it and then he does the editing and then post the the content and stuff. It's crazy, man, but it works and it, it's it's really making a big difference here in controlling this coronavirus. I mean, well, from what I see, I can only, you know, I mean, I don't know what the rest of the, you know, state is doing here in New York, but, uh, you know, me and my family, as far as quarantine life, you know, I got my wife, my three kids, I got three young daughters, uh, 11, eight and six. And, uh, you know, as far as the life we've been living, it's been, it's, I'm going to say, it's been fun. Like I feel bad for my wife because she has to do like the, the school work. They give all the homework like through the online and they have to, my wife yeah. has to do it with them. I feel bad for her with that shit. Other than that, bike rides and Uno games, man. And yeah. movies like uh, we just camped out in the living room last night. Like it's a lot of like family time 
and that's I guess one good thing about it. I mean, I'm always I always am the optimist, and uh, you know, listen, my thing is, you know, I, everybody's kind of in the same boat. Like, you know what I mean? It's one thing if I'm like, yep. dude, just my schools are getting hit, and I mean, restaurants, movie theaters yoga studios pilates i mean everybody's like yo now what we can't do this anymore so it's like yeah. that can't be the answer because you hear some fucking eggheads talking these smart motherfuckers and they're sitting there like well you know we don't need to go to a movies and you know we can watch hd at home we can do online clip yeah that might be good for you poindexter but there's a lot of people yeah. that have a different type of life and lifestyle and just to take that away is like cutting your legs off it's yeah it's crazy man it's tough, man. It's tough. You know? and, like, and, and like you said, it's hard for me to understand because like every business in Phuket shut down by, by the government. So there's only four hotels. I mean, you can imagine it's a gigantic island. So there's there's hundreds and hundreds of resorts and hotels and there's only four allowed to stay open. So when you look at all the restaurants, the businesses, especially a, a place like Thailand and, and Phuket in general, that's uh, number one economic resources tourism that has no tourists, no flights coming in and mandated to be closed. It makes me wonder who's going to survive. Like, like who, who's going to survive when this thing's over? Because unlike what you said, man, there isn't a lot of help over here. I mean, I'm having to carry the weight myself for AK Thailand. Luckily, I ran the business okay and had some cash reserves and 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 and, and have some kind of like uh, some room there. But but it's like all these other businesses. It's like it's a scary thing, man. And again, I still don't even know how long this might last. So it could last too long for me. You know, like it, like I think from the way things are going now, it's gonna we're gonna. They said today that we're going to open April 1st. They're, they're going to start letting businesses open because they have controlled co the coronavirus. Wait, wait, when? Phuket. When? I'm sorry? April. April. I'm April sorry. 1st? May 1st. May 1st. I'm sorry. Okay. May 1st. Yeah. So, so, so two weeks from April now. April Fool's joke on me. It's, it's, yeah. No, no, no. May 1st. So they're expecting two weeks to, to get the everything back to where we can open up again and stuff. And, and there's no corona on the island. But then again, there's going to be no tourists because these other countries are dealing with it. So how these exactly. countries are going to survive and how it's going to be, man, I, I don't know how it's going to be a recovery for like even America and everywhere else. It's like all these businesses are losing tons and tons of money. It's a worst case scenario, it's, like it, literally. It's uh, it's it was something just uh, that got everybody like who would it's like you're living in a Stephen King movie you know what I mean yeah. like uh, and it's 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 it is it's it's very interesting times and nobody's ever dealt with this in our lifetime like to this degree where everything is shut I mean worldwide I mean I don't know maybe a hundred years ago or and before that whatever plagues there were but seriously this is this is uh. This is a new territory for everybody. Everybody's trying to, you know, that and that, that is kind of comforting, though, because we're all in it. Like, it's not just a certain area getting it. Right. Not just New York, not just Thailand. You know what I mean? So it, something's got to, you know, we got to stay positive, you know, and, and try to help each other out. How did you end up in Thailand? I mean, did you just go there once for a training uh, 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 session and or a trip and you're like, yo, I like it? Or what, what, how how did you end up there, Mike? I, I got to ask. Yeah, so I've been going I guess to Thailand. You're up here. It's not as fun, but I want to know. Yeah, no, I've been I've been going to Thailand for 20 years. So it's been like a part of my fight camps for 20 solid years since uh, I was here for the millennium, actually, for 2000 in Bangkok. So um, oh, wow. 20 years of training Muay Thai, and then I would have to go home and re-break my, myself from the, the Muay Thai stances and the things I can't do in MMA and, and kind of save the things ah. I can do, like the elbows, the kicks, the knees. And I just always dreamed of like building my own gym here where I could, you know, have – it started out as a Muay Thai gym where I could I could come train at my own place and then when I'm gone I can let the locals train there and just have their place as well. It started out like that. And then through the years, um yeah. I, I realized it was the perfect location for many reasons to have like a legitimate gym, like an AKA gym, like a, like a gym where you could actually fight in the UFC and do MMA. So, you know, a, a team of world champion Muay Thai trainers, uh, a low economy, a very stress-free environment, very good food. Um, a great location with islands and things that you can do on the, on, you know, when you're not training, that doesn't take away from your training. It doesn't take away from, you know, what you're doing. Um, and, and so it just became the perfect place. And so I, I decided to build the perfect gym, you know, something that has the Muay Thai curriculum of Thailand and, and, and it's big. And that also has the curriculum for MMA, BJJ, strength and conditioning of America with the same level of state of the art facilities. You know, we got weight rooms, we got everything. So, 
Yeah. Let me ask you. I mean, I did some traveling, you know, obviously uh, with my my fighting career. I've been to Brazil three times, Japan three times. Brazil, I'd stay a month at a clip, you know what I mean? Because that was my love and I love training and whatnot. But uh, what is it? What is a daily like your daily routine over there before this? I want to know what's the life like over there? I mean, I have friends that visited and trained over there, places and stuff. But what is the what's a daily routine for you? I just want to know, like on a normal day before this Corona thing. Yeah, um, I, I'd stay here. I'd wake up in the morning, um, have breakfast, go to the gym. You know, the gym is uh, the, the gym starts training at eight a.m. Usually, I stay up late at night. I've been that way for a long time, so I'm up till two, three in yeah. the morning working, doing my emails on American time. So I'll get to the gym usually around eleven, maybe eleven or twelve. And then I'll be there till about eight, depending on if I'm busy or, or doing content or going and filming stuff. A lot of the marketing we do for the gym is also marketing for Phuket. We're, we're, we're selling the gym, but we're selling Phuket as well because uh, a lot of people uh. that come here, they want to train, but they also want to go to the islands and they want to get on the boats and, and do the cool stuff. So we're, sell, you know, we're, we're not uh. selling as much as we're showing what you can do here. It, it's not yeah. just about training. It's about, it's an experience and an adventure. And, and my, my, my point with the gym is, you know, I wasn't trying to build a fighter gym, you know, like as you and I know that, that I'm an entrepreneur and I want to be successful. And, and, and I, we both know that that's not where you go when you, if you build a fighter gym, you know, so I, 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 wanted, I wanted a fighter gym that has a good fight team and a good curriculum, but I wanted to build like, uh, if you can imagine like the hard rock cafe planet Hollywood of gyms, yeah. because when I was, when I was growing up, it was restaurants and then it was planet Hollywood and planet Hollywood was the cool place. That's where the celebrities were. That's where the cool things were going that's on. Really. That's, so that's what I turned this into. And so I have like, you know, I got Dan Bilzer and I got Dana White was coming. You know, obviously he came here and, 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 and helped promote the gym. And then we've had Damian Hurst. We've had so many celebrities that came through here and we're creating the cool factor, the it factor. So it's like we made the gym super big, super cool uh, in a great location. Uh, so it, I'm creating that experience. It's an experience in Phuket. You know, it's not just a gym. Look, uh, let me ask you the. In, in uh over there um is it just i know there's obviously there's a ton of ton of tie fights but is there ever any mma events over there or no yeah i I've, I've actually put on two events in thailand mma events oh. yeah i did one on the you know beach what, you know what would be awesome what would be awesome is when we get back on the road with dana white looking for a fight we do fucking thailand i was going to ask you this because uh he mentioned uh, that he was going to go to Thailand with the looking for a fight. And then I think he said he had a deal with Netflix or, or someone, YouTube, I can't remember. And then it actually posted the places y'all plan to go internationally. And Thailand was one of them. And so I was actually going to ask you what the update was. Are, are you guys still doing the show? And, and are y'all planning on going overseas? Or, or what's the update on that? Well, with def this show is, uh, is very successful. I know it's on YouTube. Uh, you know, it's it, – like, even the last one we did in Hawaii, even though we don't put them out too often because really Dane is so busy, man. That's what it really comes down to, you know. Uh, but when we get them – when we do go, we just went to – we did one in Hawaii. Uh, Dana White looking for a fight in Hawaii. And I think in a week it got just under a million – a million views, like 900,000. Now it's over a million. So it's like it's so awesome that people enjoy like the show. Like, you know what I mean? Because it's, I'm, and man, what a great gig, Mikey. It's myself, Dana, for the people who haven't watched Dana White looking for a fight. It's, uh, it's myself, Dana, and my buddy, Dean Thomas. You know, the great Dean Thomas, I'm sure. Yep. But, uh, and, and dude, it, it's, we have such a good time. And I feel like the recipe for all, uh, for most entertainment, at least anything that I'm involved in, whether it's my podcast, uh, UFC Unfiltered with Jim Norton, yep. I call him Jimmy. Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy Bird, and uh, or my the show with Dana is if we're having a good time, like a genuinely good time, I feel the people are also, and that's what you get. That's, what, that's what's happening. Like looking for a fight, man. We're just being ourselves. We just have the, the cameras always on us. They chop up, and I'm like, oh man, I didn't even realize it was we were being that silly or doing this or that. But we just have a good time, and uh, people seem to dig it. And the same thing with the podcast with Jimmy. So man, Mikey, I'm so fortunate and you know being a fighter uh and had a, a career in the ufc that once it's over shit man guys are riding that that roller coaster and they're like this is the fucking life i'm getting paid to fight and i'm flying and yeah. i'm me i'm signing the autographs and when it's over it could be over over and then there's people looking around like oh shit and now i gotta start 
from scratch. And that yep. is a scary fucking thing. And I've yes, seen sir. it from, I seen it very close. And, uh, again, man, knock on fucking wood that, uh, I'm doing okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I never take that. I never take that for granted. You know, I hear you, man. I lived it. Especially, you know, so I know. Yeah. I, had, I and, went through the Mike, same thing, man. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, what, what was your last fight, by the way? Which was your last one? My last fight was the Conor McGregor fight with uh, Chad Mendes. UFC uh, 189, maybe? I think it was 189. How many years ago was that? It was 2015. When did you retire? 2015. 2015. I was retired before oh, sh- 2015, but I had finally built my gym, finally got it operational. So I had to do one more fight camp from my gym. That was my dream was to build this this whole thing, to be able to do a, a, a UFC fight camp from it. And so I couldn't build the gym and then not do it. You know what I mean? I had to do it. We filmed a big yeah. uh, we filmed a big thing on YouTube building up to it, a 10-part series of me training and going out and hanging out on the islands and, you know, this whole thing. And then I went and took this fight with uh, Alex Garcia, who's uh, who was uh, George St. Pierre's guy, r- really strong wrestler guy. And, you know, it, it was a fun fight, man. It, it was my last fight. I lost a decision, but it, it was fun because I didn't get beat up. You know, I, I felt good in the fight. The, the buildup was good. The, the attention from the crowd, being on the Conor McGregor card with all the fans there for the weigh-ins and, and the press was good. Yeah. The fight was fun, man. I was out there and we were punching each other in the face. I didn't get hurt. You know, he took me down and held me and like, you know, so I lost a decision and it wasn't, it wasn't detrimental, but it was fun. What I wanted out of it, I got out of it. It wasn't like I was trying to be a champion or come back and, and, and make some big mark. He's yeah. 10 years younger, 10 years younger than me, you know, good for him. But I was trying to, you know, show that I could do a, a fight camp from the gym and it worked. You know, I did really well as far as my conditioning and I, and I, I enjoyed having the fight camp from Thailand. I just wish I had have built the gym 10 years prior. Um, and then, you know, going back on, yeah, I, I, I guess that's it. So, so it was, yeah, 2015, 30, I was 37. Um, but, but I want to get into something else. I, I know I'm missing something else that we talked about. I, I'll probably touch on it in a second, but something that was real significant, uh, between us and my career was, uh, UFC 69 in Texas. You fought GSP. I fought Yushin Okami. Yes. So I was riding a oh, five yeah. fight win. I was fighting a uh, riding a five fight win streak. I beat David Loazzo, and technically I became the number one contender to fight Anderson Silva. Uh, at that time, Travis Luter won the TV show. He jumped ahead to get the title shot, and I could either wait or fight Yushin Okami. And it was in my hometown in Houston, where I'm from. The big UFC finally coming. That's right. To, so I took that fight. Uh, we didn't know Yushin Okami at that time how strong he was and how dominant he was on the ground. Obviously. Um, <laughs> Kind of overlooked him a little bit, but that's not an excuse. You know, I came out there and fought hard. Uh, it was a close fight, lost a decision, but that was my first UFC loss. And not only did I lose a decision, I lost in my hometown, and I also lost my title shot against Anderson Silva, which probably was a good thing now that I see what Anderson Silva kind of became since that point. You know, he, he had like two wins yeah. at that time, I think. He wasn't like the Anderson Silva we know today. But yeah. uh, but I will say I was I was detrimentally like – hurt walking I, I left early from the the uh, stadium and i went across to the hotel and i was just like broken inside you know because i feel like i let everybody down and everybody it was in houston so they were thinking about me being the hometown boy losing and you know they were cheering till the end and of course the, the support was there but i was just i felt like i let everybody down all the attention was on me and i lost the fight and it was just such a such a bad moment and all of a sudden when i walked into the hotel room i mean i'm sorry the the hotel lobby the place went fucking crazy. It was going crazy and people were running around and like just, it was just, it was a mayhem, right? And I was like, what the hell happened? Yeah, I couldn't understand what happened. And they said, Matt Sarah just knocked out GSP. And I was like, holy shit, are you kidding? Like Matt Sarah beat GSP. And I was so thankful that you won that fight and, and took all that attention off of me. And like, I didn't have to feel like everybody was like, everybody was like thinking about how, how I lost somehow that made me feel so much better. And I was happy for you too, you know, going in there as the underdog and getting that big win. But it was, it was, it was, it was amazing because I, it instantly, I felt better. Like, wow. Okay. Wait to lift it a little bit because that's huge news. Yeah. Man. Something huge happened, you know, like who cares about me right yeah. now? Who cares about me getting beat? So like it, it kind of helped me a little bit. It kind of helped me a little bit, and then. Uh, thanks. I remember. Uh, I remember. Be- I remember talking to you uh, after that, and I remember going into that lob. I remember the post fight presser, the little thing, and uh, and I remember talking to you there. Little things like uh, I remember you were depressed, 
a little bit, but you were, but you were always so nice, Mike. We always got along well, and yep. you were happy for. I know you were happy for me. That was really nice. I appreciate that. And I remember walking into that same lobby, and uh, you know, back then we dealt with fans like it was it was kind of crazy sometimes. But holy shit, man, I couldn't get through that goddamn lobby. It was wild, yeah. man. Wild, 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 uh, wild night. You know what I mean? That was Diego Sanchez's first loss to your teammate too, to Josh Koscheck. Yep. Do you remember that? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and it was a it was a wild time. But I'll tell you right now, I was I was better at uh, you know being the uh, being the guy to to get the upset than than be the champion. That was never. I, I'm not saying that was never my goal, but it was. I'm, I'm a guy that liked to fight, and uh, I like to fight the best fighters in the world. But I, I never. I'm way better having a Rocky movie than some champion that's going to be fucking, uh, you know, reigning for such a long time, like a St. Pierre or Anderson Silver. I'm not saying that I'm not a, a bad motherfucker because we all feel we are. <laughs> but yeah. I, I just, I just, it's just not. It just didn't feel like me. It's not my role. So uh, that was my, that was my Rocky movie. You know. <laughs> Yeah, so and that was it. it. You know? As you said, man, we got along really good together, and, and you're and you were so full of energy, man. I know we didn't hang out a lot, but when I saw you at the events, I was always excited to see you and say hi because you had so much energy. Um, even when you're ranting on your podcast stuff like that, like either way, it's just good. It, it's it's just energy. It's just it's entertaining, you know. That's and I, I I remember it was just I was so happy for you just because like you know GSP was beating everybody, you know, and and uh, I wasn't a welterweight yeah. at that time, so it didn't really matter to me, but. Um, he was beating everybody and GSP had to beat you or whoever else. It would just be another win for GSP, you know? And like the fact that you yeah. won, that was such a bigger thing. And, and it was such a bigger moment that happened that night and you got to have it, which is you're one of the nicer guys in the UFC, one of the nicest guys in the UFC. And so that made me happy, man, because like, it was like, wow. And you were so, I could just see how happy you were too. And like, and you not only beat him, you know, arguably one of the best welterweights of all time, uh, but also became a champion. That was just like you said, a Rocky moment. So I was, just, I was happy for you, man. Like, I was definitely stoked, and uh, and it was cool. It was, it was that was that's something I'll never forget, man. So it was like a, a a cool thing to happen after a bad thing for me. Yeah, man. Well, it's so strange you, you, the journey, you know. Like when I first got involved, like I was like a like a scrappy kid, like a street fighting type kid, like you know in the neighborhood. I have my share of fights, and. Uh, and then when I found the Gracies, I found these tapes of the Gracies and uh, their philosophy and their approach to fighting was, and this was again back in when I was 17, when I found these uh, VHS, H, VHS tapes of uh, the Gracies, uh, Gracie in Action, Gracie in Action 2. I don't I know if you've seen those. Yo, yeah. Oh, fucking classic. Absolutely. That, that opened my eyes. That was, again, if you, now kids grow up on the UFC, they know what it is. When we were growing up, we didn't know what real fight. We, we, you know, we saw glimpses here and there, but who would win? We never knew. So before the UFC. So when I seen these tapes prior to the UFC became about, and I'm like, whoa, this is real fighting style versus style. So the Gracie's approach, I had to un like, get out of my mind. No, never exchange, never exchange. Close that distance, get them down. Now you could be the hammer, they're the nail, they can't really do much. So I saw the, them doing this in these Gracie and Action tapes. And then uh, I st that's how I started to fight. I started to train that way, closing the distance. You don't ever want to exchange. So, you know, I had to learn on the job in the UFC. And again, my first fight was UFC 31. So it was still, guys were starting to, to get more, obviously more well-rounded, the Pat Militiches and Carlos yeah. Newton and... And all these guys that were just more than just one style. And and I had to really kind of learn on the job. And it wasn't that I was a pussy or afraid of getting hit. It was just the mentality and the philosophy and the approach of the jujitsu uh, fighters and, and the mentality of never exchanging. And right. I had to learn. And with Ray Longo, it's good, though, in a sense, because it kept my awareness and my – uh, my of the of of um distance management and stuff like that that a lot of people might not have now if, when they just learn it all together type of thing but it took ray longo to really put me i mean literally i mean when i fought shoney carter i didn't have much much rounds clocked in at all standing up but when i was 18 before i even learned jiu-jitsu or was just found out about it 
I fought in a tough man contest in Manhattan at the Palladium. Mr. T was the referee. It was only boxing. I never sparred a day <laughs> in my life. And my, my boxing buddy told me, turn sideways, you're less of a target. And that's all I knew. And I knocked out two guys before losing in, in the finals. It was all heavyweight, 175 and up. I was 17 yeah. years old, eight, seven, 18 years old. And so I knew I had, I had like heavy hands. But that yeah. was before I had to forget about that develop the approach of not striking. So it's, it was a weird like thing in my head that I had to overcome. And I didn't really start, besides the Caro fight, which which I kind of had to rely on my, my striking, and, and I clocked in a ton of rounds of straight up boxing because I had an ACL thing that I had to work, I couldn't really grapple. So I did a lot of boxing and straight running because I couldn't really fuck with my meniscus was busted. But I had to really say, all right, man, even when I fought in the ultimate fighter, I was still, if you saw my show me corner fight on that, I was still just striking to get in, striking yeah. the not, do you know what I mean? And I was doing okay with it, but I never, like now I'd be like, dude, I would just do a fucking Frank trick to him and lay him out, you know what I mean? Because yeah. I developed, it, it's just like rolling, Mike. It, it, it takes time and time to, you have to be in that pocket to know how to roll with it and to come back and to trust it. and to st- So it took, like Lago to be like, look, man, I like not to totally unlearn that approach, like the, the the safety of the distance management and whatnot. But and especially as a welterweight, if I'm gonna have a sport versus sword, so when I approached George St. Pierre with that training camp, it started off. It was weird, man, because it was me in the beginning fighting the way I used to, and then I remember there was a time that he got hurt and we had to postpone it. He got hurt. Yes. So, yes, he got hurt. We had to postpone it. And I remember something happened in training where I'm like, look, man, we Longo was just like, look, you have to really believe in your fists. He goes, look what you're look what you're doing with the 16 ounce gloves, trying to get too close to the guy. You land any shots and you're almost like how Khabib did with Connor. How he, he's worried about the yep. takedown. He landed the guy. I had landing some stuff just to get a hold of people. And I was hurting them with 16 ounce gloves. You know, yeah. I broke one buddy's jaw with that shit. And with a 16 ounce glove, so Longo was like, look, Matt, if you land with these four ounce gloves, like you landed on so-and-so in training, like it's going to be, I don't give a fuck. It's lights out. I don't give a fuck who it is. And I remember I really had to take that to to change my mentality going into that fight. And I did. And so if you see that fight compared to any of my other ones, especially the ultimate fighter fights, it was a totally different approach. And if yeah. I didn't have that, I definitely I, – I, I wouldn't have won because the chance of me getting Georgie down would be brutal. I mean, and I would have got t- – and the worst thing you know, Mike, is trying to get a takedown and not getting it and then you're exhausted. Yeah. And yeah. So it's weird, man. It was like a coming out party and I had the element of surprise because he thought I was just going to try to take him down. So the fact that I was making it – it felt like a sparring session. Mike, you ever have one of those fights that it just feels like a good sparring session? Like, you yeah. know what I mean? Like you just yep. – like in the zone, and that, and that's exactly how it. I seen all the strikes coming, like it was like the Matrix, like because Longo had him. He's like, dude, he does this karate high kick. He does this. Longo yeah. was showing me all this. He's not that. So he was showing me how to like take everything away, and it was like I was seeing it. And just like the second re- the rematch was like a bad day of sparring. This was like yeah. an excellent day of sparring, <laughs> and because of my change of philosophies and, and strategies, and and my belief in my stand up through. The rounds I clocked in over at Longo's, it ended yeah. up being a great night. I don't know if that was long winded, but fuck, you took me no, down memory lane. Good. Yeah, that's good, man. And and like I had a fight with David Lawaza, which was my my same thing that you're talking about, man. I was my my proudest fight, and it was because I I trained and prepared so hard strategically for that fight. I remember I, I brought in Kung Lee because I was worried about uh, David Lawaza's spinning back it's kick. Sp- yeah, so he, he actually taught me the best way to do a spinning back kick, and I ended up landing spinning back kicks on Loazo in that fight and didn't get caught by his. I avoided his, uh, you know, he, he gives his back so that you'll take his back and then he'll turn around and reverse you and end up on top and elbow you down. I didn't fall for that. So that was like that same moment you're talking about where the whole fight, things were just like really working out, and, and my strategy, I was sticking to it. And I was That was the, the one fight where we went back to the dressing room and I was just like proud of myself. I was like, wow, you know what? You you know, not you didn't just win the fight and you're happy about it, but like, damn man, you 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 did what you were supposed to do and fought a smart fight. And and it was kind of like what you I guess you're talking about there. And I was like real proud of of how I I guess you know adapted to each circumstance, each situation. As I got tired, I I monitored it and, and didn't let it you know overcome me. And it was uh it was a cool cool yeah. moment. 
It's funny you said that about Loazo because I was just thinking that when you said that, how he would give up his back. Yep. Guys would be like, oh, there's the hooks. Let me get those hooks in. And then especially – because, it's, listen, it's, it's jiu-jitsu 101. Hooks first, choke second. You see yep. the back, you get those hooks in your choke. But then that's what happens in MMA when guys thought – and he was one of the first, Loazo, to just use that as a, as a, a tactic. You know, yep. the crow. We should give him a nice shout out. I like, he's such a nice yep. guy, too, David Loazzo. Um, what a sweetheart guy. of a guy. Yep. You know, I got to reach out to him. I know he's got a jiu-jitsu school also, which is amazing because yeah. he's known for all his striking. Yeah, I think he's got a jiu-jitsu school, you know. Oh, wow, I didn't and, know that. Uh, and yeah, yeah, no, the crow, the crow uh, martial arts school, whatever. He's, yeah, I love you him, You know, man. he's a great guy. But uh, he was one of those guys where it's like, oh, look at that. I So if I was like cornering against him, and it's funny because we've done that in the future where – like Weidman was fighting um, Kevin Kel- Kelvin Gastelum. And I'm like, yo, man, don't just try. This is one of those guys where he gives up the bag. It's a similar thing. But he's good at getting out from there, and he's compact and gets on top. So, like, we would do more of a wrestling ride to work him over. And so right. it's, it, it, it brings me back to, like, the Loazo. Like, I think I was actually pointing that out where I'm like, look, man, some guys want you to get those hooks in because they go yeah. belly up, and then it's so slick and skin on skin. Next thing you know, they're on top. I mean, you lose that seatbelt, so – Oh, man, yeah. that's funny. It's funny with the uh, how the sport evolves like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I want to I go back a little bit one more time to this this UFC 69. So I bring this up way too much, man, and I'm, I'm ridiculous for this. This is like my – this is my war story. This is this is my hero moment of MMA, my, my, my one thing that I'm so proud of. So uh, – Long story short, I was the first guy to to use a sponsor banner in combat sports, and it was that fight that I did it. We we, yeah, yeah, we dropped the uh, oh, the banner I didn't know that. very first time. Yeah, and the crazy thing was, I never had any feedback for it. That was that night was the first time we did it, and we got the idea. It was with Fitch and Bob Cook because of the American Top Team guys were dropping their their logo from their gym. And so we thought, because we were getting so many sponsors, because it was we were tied in with Chuck and Forrest. It was the same management. So we had Zions, and we had all these sponsors yeah. and stuff. And so we thought, why don't we drop a banner and put sponsors on it so we can get more money and, and, and promote? Of course, it wasn't like the, the regulation. It was like this freaking thing was like eight feet long, and like it was gigantic. Yeah. And Bob, Bob came up to me. He's like, okay, so we're, we have this idea about putting this banner behind you and, and, and dropping it. And, you know, what do you think about that? And I was like, man, Bob, like, Y'all, y'all are gonna get kicked out of my corner. Dana's gonna come over there and kick y'all out. I'm gonna go back. There's gonna be nobody there. So I was like a little nervous, yeah. but I was like, we talked about. It. I was like, all right, I'll do it, no problem. And so we did it, and like nothing was said. Like literally, like I didn't do it as some like I'm starting a a, a thing or anything. We just did it, you know. Nothing was ever yeah. said by UFC. Nothing was ever said by a fighter. No fighter came up to him and was like, man, did you get in trouble for that? Or how did you do it? Or who told you to do it? Or can I wonder if I can do it? Like nothing. So you're the first guy I had yeah. on the podcast that was actually on that fight card. So I wanted to ask you, because you know, you're, you're getting ready for a fight. You were getting ready to fight GSP. You're watching the monitor. Sometimes you're watching the fights. Did you happen to have any memory of seeing that thing come down and then just be like, what the fuck is he doing? Like, <laughs> Because I have I've had no, nobody no, I mention mean, it. I had a, I believe I had something with Sarah Longo on it, but nothing nothing with sponsors or anything. I yeah, believe no I had did something. At that time. Tell you the truth, there's no way. Like you know, I'm, I'm about to fight out. Everybody thought I was walking to my death, so I, I don't think yeah, I was yeah. really. I figured uh, that. I figured. Concerned with the bat. That's a fucking hysterical question. <laughs> but, you remember the yeah, I, get... I put down? I'm like, dude, I thought I was walking. I was going to face yeah. a killer. <laughs> <laughs> I get it now. And you know what's funny, Mikey? But I've always you know, wanted to ask somebody who noticed it. Like, did anybody notice it? Because the funny thing was, is like nobody said a word. And then Koscheck reused it, the same banner for Diego. So we shared the same banner. We had the same sponsors. And nobody said a word. And then the next fight, a couple more happened. Then the next fight, a couple more happened. And then it just became a thing. So I've always wanted to ask somebody, like, from from that actually that night, if they happened to see it and were just like, what the hell? And, of course, you happen to be the first guy who's fighting GSP. So yeah. it makes no sense to ask you. But I had to ask you anyway. Um, but I also wanted to mention this. I also wanted to mention it because I know you're good friends with Dana White. And I had Dana White on the podcast. And, and I mentioned it to him because I didn't think he even – he didn't even know. And, and I mentioned it to him thinking like he'd be like, oh, man, good job. That, that, that's cool that you have that moment of, uh, in UFC history, you know. And I mentioned it to Dana White. And I think his words were, yeah, that was the single worst fucking thing 
that ever happened in the UFC. He goes, you dropped that fucking banner. And I couldn't even see what the hell was going on inside the octagon. He was joking when he said it, but he was kind of serious because you know how Dana doesn't like the sponsored banners and stuff like that. So he was like joking, but he was like, that's the single worst thing that fucking happened in the UFC. You started the worst thing that ever happened you dropped that fucking banner i couldn't see what the hell was going on inside the the octagon i was wondering what the hell the thing was and so that's, that's another hysterical. reason i wanted to bring it up so yeah you know what i mean it, yeah that night though mikey i had also uh on, we had three of us fighting on that card so i had luke cuomo knocked out josh haynes yeah, josh yeah. haynes i think he became a cop in vegas p drago cell was fighting up in in in, in uh in middleweight, and he lost to uh, Thales Leites. He went to a decision. That's what I love about Drago, though, uh, Pete Drago Cell, is if you see after I get the title, you wouldn't know. Drago was so happy in that cage with me, just wiling out, whatever he does. And when yeah. I was getting my hand raised, you would never have known the guy lost the fight. You know, until you see his face and it's all fucking lumped up. But uh, the dude was so happy for me. So I, I, I yeah. just remember that. Now I'm the godfather to his kid. We're still close. Yeah, cool. You man. know, That's awesome. are you still close with those uh, AKA guys or no? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're family. Like, we, you know, I was there when we started AK. Like, like it was the American Kickboxing Academy. When I first went there, it was Team Shamrock. And so we were all on Team Shamrock at American Kickboxing Academy. Um, Frank left and, and parted with the team. And so then it was just a bunch of us nobodies. Like, you know, it was me, Josh Thompson, uh, Paul Buenatello, Trevor Prangley, uh, Bobby Southworth, a couple other guys. And uh, we were just like, what the hell do we do now? We lost our five-time UFC champion superstar. And we're just like, fuck, what do we yeah. call ourselves? And, and we just decided to call ourselves Team AKA. We got Luke in there eventually. Then eventually Fitch came in and Koscik came in. And then, of course, uh, finally uh, Kane, then uh, DC, then, you know, then it just the list goes on. So uh, I was there the when we kind of yeah. – when we kind of formed it and then we just kind of like, you know, we started working on different things and, and taking what worked and, and getting rid of what didn't work. And we just started building this curriculum that, that I still use here in Thailand with, with this gym. Whatever uh, happened to Josh Kashek? It's like he fell off the, I don't know, I hear this guy from this guy anymore. Whatever happened to him? He had a, he had a big you know? falling out. He was a very like uh, fire, fiery person, you know. So he had a big, you know. He he was always a strong personality. So whether it was good or bad, he always was real strong about things. And and so sometimes it was good, and sometimes he rubbed people the wrong way. He had a big falling out with Javier, and they separated. He left the gym, and yeah. pretty much after he left the gym, we just all. I mean, we of course we weren't going to leave. You know, we had a great team, so we all just kind of yeah. stayed there. Some people kind of stayed in touch and went back and forth. Uh, I saw him a few times since then, but pretty much, man. Is he working? Like, is he, how's he doing? What's he up he, to? He's, he does actually have a good job. He trains the military. It, one of our sponsors that, the, that we had at that time, but when I, we fought together, actually, uh, OG Technologies is like a contractor for the government, and they do contract work. And so uh, he was a sponsor of ours, and he ended up giving Kostik a job training the military. So I think he has his own like facility where he like basically t teaches some kind of combatives to the to the troops That's and cool. i hear it's a pretty good job so he i think he's doing okay i, I just haven't talked to him and, and so we haven't never had any like problems except that he blew my knee out and caused yeah. me not to fight for three years but other than that <laughs> it wasn't like a purposely done thing but uh yeah so i mean i know he's doing pretty good but i haven't really talked to him that much to be honest yeah man i you know i like to hear when guys are doing well when they're done fighting you know what i mean yeah. i like to hear the success stories not the fucking war machine stories you know <laughs> yeah of course yeah those aren't good uh, those no, are definitely not good you know and i like well, what y'all are doing man <laughs> yeah i like what y'all are doing man. i did watch a lot of uh, i did like watch a lot of the uh looking for a fight obviously and uh, you know uh, yeah. i like the donut one and then i liked when y'all were on the beach and y'all i heard a story we all were like all getting ready for that but y'all were all like brick houses on the beach and doing the little swimming thing and I, I love that show man and like that's why i'm wondering when it's gonna when it's going to come back obviously you have a great podcast and and you're doing great with yeah. that jim norton jim norton but i wanted to ask you about your podcast obviously you know i'm not a professional like you are and stuff but uh what 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 is it that you're looking to do in the future are you are you looking to stay doing more mma kind of podcast and and stay in this realm or are you looking to possibly like venture off like in more of i, I not the same but kind of a joe rogan sort of area where you're just going to be i guess talking to more people and covering more topics or like what is your plans for the future uh, and what I, are some Id ideal guests that you would like to have outside well, of well i mean listen I mean, I like the the model of just making a very loose 
um, atmosphere and uh, just shooting the shit like we're doing now. That's what I like yeah. doing. I am not some, you know, uh, I'm not some, I, I'm not, I would not be suited behind the desk as an analyst with the tie and yeah, the, somebody tells a bad joke. And somebody, <laughs> one of the, one of the fucking go on. They, they, first of all, they're in your ear with that. I did it a couple times when they were back at Fox <laughs> and oh, fuck did I hate it. Oh God, everybody's so uptight and all right, whatever you do, don't curse. We're going on there. And you got the mic in your ear and, and I got ADD. So I, I'm talking also like, all right, rap, rap, rap. I go, what the fuck? I got to say, got this person in my ear. I'm talking. I remember Rashad Evans and I love Rashad. And he got yeah. cooler over the years. I like him even more now. He's like, he seems like almost a half a hippie now. I like him better now than I did even back then. But I remember I was talking to him. He was like, and I remember looking at me. And I remember this guy don't give a fuck what I'm saying. He's just kind of concentrating on what he's going to say. <laughs> and then I'm like, dude, I go, Karen Bryan is a sweetheart. She does a bad joke. I go, oh, fuck off, everybody. I don't like that shit, Mikey. I That's like so funny. hanging That's out with so Jimmy. Funny. I like hanging out with Jimmy. We talk the fights, obviously. We have a great time talking about uh, uh, every upcoming cards. I love. I mean, we're getting like guys who are like really like friends of the show now. Whether it be uh, Mickey Gall, Uriah Hall, like guys that are just they feel uh, you know the Black Beast. I love him. Like we have like a good relationship when they call in, and it's just such. It's just a really dude. It's just a fun time. And I don't even look at it like. I'm some I'm, I'm no Joe Rogan. I, these guys, Joe Rogan. I love his podcast. The best fucking thing yeah. out there. But I mean, listen, I'm a fucking Neanderthal next to him. I'm not gonna. He's got the scientists on and stuff. I'm, like, hey man. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't I mean do, that direction. Oh yeah, no. But my point is like, if for future, like, yes, I love and, and our 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 podcast UFC Unfiltered is it's pop culture also because I love talking movies or what I'm into with that. I talk my right. virtual reality that I'm fucking so into when I love my vibe and I got my fucking thing on. I love that shit. I'm like a big kid, but I would love, I don't you know, you know who Kevin Smith is Kevin yeah, Smith, the director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does a lot of side podcasts and stuff. And he does like a lot of geek shit and believe yeah. it or not, which you probably will believe it. I'm a fucking geek comic book. Yeah. Uh, knowledge oh, and star wars movies that's what <laughs> I'm i didn't into. know that I okay. don't never t- if you tell me who's in the fucking super bowl who's going to be in the world series i don't even fucking know to be honest with you i love fighting and i love the geek shit and that's what i like to do so i would like to do some shit with that maybe more go into more stuff like that my buddy christian holoff he does uh he, he does um set uh Sen Live, it's his own podcast. He used to be a part of uh, what the fuck was it called? Uh, Collider. All these like geek sites. I've been on his show a couple of times, and it's just stuff I can relate to. I can relate to stuff like that. You know what I mean? So it's a little odd, but so am I. You know? Yeah, no, no I so get it. My, and so is my so is my quarantine facial hair. <laughs> yeah, that man, I didn't shave either today. You know, I just yeah. I didn't mean like Joe Joe Rogan specifically. No no one could be Joe Rogan, obviously, be be yeah. who he is and, and get his guests, but I just meant going in so many different directions to to talk to people. He's on a professional level, you're on a professional yeah. level. This is more of a hobby for me I enjoy doing. But I had like Mickey Rourke, you know, I was, he, he was, I did his first podcast he's ever done. Uh, I had David Castaneda, who's a, a, a star of Umbrella Academy on Netflix. I had JJ Soria, who's on uh, another gentified show. It's on Netflix and stuff. I enjoy mixing it up and kind of, one thing I will say, like you, I don't like interviewing. I like having talks. I like having conversations where yeah. people can join in. And if they're interested in the, my guest or myself, they can enjoy the conversation and feel like they're a part of our conversation. And we can just cover a bunch of different subjects. But I, I do like covering things outside MMA, which is why I asked you because you're so good at covering MMA. And, and obviously, you, you explain that you are you, you like the Star Wars and the comic book type stuff. So <laughs> it's just it's fun Sounds for me so to funny. like move around. It, it's fun for me to move around a little bit and talk to different people that are, you know, known for different things and not not science just like joe i'm not like some brainiac or anything but yeah, definitely yeah. different types of people than face punchers all the time you know yeah no listen man i mean we have alex paul uh, uh, alec paulson call in he's an actor this guy's like six foot six fucking great yeah. guy he's in a bunch of different shit uh you know we have different uh what is it uh, uh frank grillo he was in the marvel movies he was yeah bold, he's awesome uh, bold. he was in a lot of movies great guy great guy no we have you know i'm i'm all into talking to different people uh 
but I got to be interested. So if it's like um, something that I'm not interested in, like in the politics and this and that, I don't give a fuck. So I don't don't, don't right. bring them to me. You know, I mean, if we bring in a sports guy, uh, I like to know more about what he's streaming and uh, stuff like that, what he does in his pastime, than how many fucking touchdowns because I don't really give a fuck about the football. So yeah. you know what I mean. So I'm with you. you know, man. I'm I get with a you. certain. You know what I mean. I get a. I, I need a certain. Uh, you know, person that I'd, I'd like to shoot the shit with. You know. Hey guys, sorry about the break, but I have to thank our sponsor, aka Thailand. I want to let you guys know that we are still doing our 30% off reopen special. Everything set up on the website. If you are coming to Thailand after this crisis, after this pandemic, after we reopen, this is the best time to buy. This is the most you will ever save at AKA Thailand, 30% off all group classes. So if you want to go to akathailand.com, it's completely set up. All the prices are updated. You can book a week. You can book a month. You can book a year. Whatever you want to do until we hit our budget, um, the, the, money that we, the, the, the amount that we allocated to do this special, um, 30% discount, and you can redeem it any time in the future. So if we open up April, I'm sorry, May 1st uh, as planned, um, you can use it then. You can use it May 1st of next year. You can use it in three months from now, any time in the future. But you have to book while we have the special going on, which we don't know how long it's going to last because we are going to stop it once we get to this this budget we allocated for it. Um, so anyway, go to akthailand.com. You can book it there. And if you have any questions, email us at info at akthailand.com. Thank you. What are you streaming right now? Are you watching anything over there? In fucking yeah, you know, what I was you, gonna, I, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about this actually, but uh, I wanted to talk to you about. Obviously, uh, you probably know this is coming, but uh, this Tiger King man, I, I watched the the whole season of Tiger King, and that was, I mean, that's what, what's your take on that? I've had a few different people. Some some people thought it was amazing, um, and then some people thought it was just garbage. So I thought it was fascinating, super fascinating. That's uh, listen, a hundred percent. I'm with you. When I first. Uh, you know, me and my wife go through shows, you know, and she was, uh, I put on the little thing on that. I heard about it. So we're like, you know what? I want to give it a shot. Let's watch one episode. So we watched one and then I'm like, this is fucking wacky. But that yeah. guy is very, <laughs> um, he's very, you know, he, he gets you. Like you, you get, you get channeled in. You're like, well, look at this guy's pretty interesting. I mean, he's a whack job yeah. the Joe exotic, <laughs> but then you start, you, it gets, it, then you meet this other guy. The other guy has animals, the big heavy guy. And oh my God, he seems a little more normal. Okay, I, this guy's maybe the normal guy. And then it gets into him with the how many wives and girlfriends. And the, and now I'm like, this guy's wacky. And then you get into Carol uh, Baskin and, you, and now they're talking yeah. about that. And I'm like, oh, she seems like, oh, maybe she's doing the right thing. Oh, look, the husband's kind of like a cuck. He's walking around with a leash on and he's, he's afraid of her. And it's a weird <laughs> dynamic. And then you find out about the husband missing. You're like, oh, fuck, what am I watching? This is amazing. Uh, so it kept getting worse. And the characters kept getting more bizarre. So yeah. I 100% I'm all in. I even watched the last, the, the follow-up episode, like the extra one. With, yeah, I did too. With, uh, Joel, uh, Joel McHale. He's a funny guy. Joe McHale. What's Joe McHale. Name? Joe McHale. What a funny guy. I like that yeah. guy. He's hysterical. Yeah. I love his dry sense of humor. He was great in Ted. And uh, I, I, I uh, speaking of Ted, Mark Wahlberg, underrated uh, comedic yeah. actor. Yeah. Everybody for knows sure. him for playing the, the special forces guy. Funny as fuck. The other guys, both Ted movies, extremely uh, uh, under underrated. Uh, this is what I get. Yeah. This, this Mike. This is what I get passionate about. Fucking movies. Yeah. No, <laughs> so I, this I, is I what I like. Know. And even, you know? even what you just described but, on the Tiger King, as crazy as you described right now, you, you still, as crazy as that was, you didn't mention the hitman, you didn't mention the con yes. man, and you didn't mention the two husbands that were straight, that married the gay guy. <laughs> so it's like, you, you left I mean, off still all of that. That's a whole other like, show in itself, and that was still was part of it. So it's like, that shows how crazy that show is. And you know there's going to be a season two for sure. That crazy kid who blew his brains out by accident, Travis, I mean, yeah. he would come in. Yeah, he'd come in and he would uh, point the gun at the friend. And when the friend, I mean, the way that went down was like, what the? F uh, oh my! That alone was a moment of this dude just killed himself by accident. But first of all, 
you know, I'm rest in peace. But that fucking idiot could have killed his friend. He's sitting there. Ah, oh, there's nothing in it. I mean, it's like it's scary yeah. shit, man. I mean, I, that just was so. What a real. I mean, talk about reality TV. The thing I do like about the show is it's not. It's it, it's everything seems real. Where I've done stuff before, it's like, oh, look at the angle they're trying to put this in. Was that taken right. out of context? No, these people are fucking. It's it's for good or bad. It's fucking real. So, and well, I don't. That husband's was... definitely that that husband was fucking. I don't give a fuck. I feel he was that fucking. That guy became fucking tiger shit. Yeah, <laughs> Carol. Guy, yeah, I, made... I think Carol killed her husband for sure. And, and, and the reason it looked so real was because a lot of the footage they used was real footage that they had. And I'm going to tell you something like, man, if you want to get uh, entertained a little bit more if you're in, in your quarantine and stuff. So if you go to YouTube, you know, there's a Joe Exotic YouTube page. And so me and my buddy Mark were like, man, you know, he had, you know, because they talk about it on the show. He had he was trying to be famous and had his own show and had his own like YouTube channel. So we actually went to his YouTube page. And we went a couple of videos back to his little uh, Joe Exotic live video show or whatever. And I, I mentioned this on a previous podcast, but you know, you know, like when you put something out, I have to explain this again for anyone that's listening. But when you put something out, like like you know, you 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 gather all this content and footage, and 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 then you put an episode together. It's forty five minutes or whatever. At some point, you look at it and you're like, okay, this is good, perfect. This is what I want. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and post it. This is so unperfect. And when you watch it, like when you watch this thing unfold and you know that he beforehand must have thought this was like go time, you know, like it is absolutely unreal. It's as shocking. It's as shocking as the actual Tiger King. And he actually kills an animal during the show. He, he, he shoots a cow point, point blank. He goes, he's sitting in his chair and he goes, uh, uh, one second, we have a public service announcement. And then he has a gun, like this rifle, and there's a cow laying on the ground that's alive. It's just laying, kind of like kneeling down. And he's like, you know, Trump gets all this bad press for this, this, something. I guess Trump did something with the animals. I don't know. And he's like, and then he puts the gun on the, the cow and he shoots it in the head and it just rolls over. And his legs start just kind of shaking. Then at the end of the episode, he says, if I have to shoot three more animals to get on the news, I'll do it. And I, this is still on YouTube. Like that was one of, we've only seen one so far. That was one of his shows. It's absolutely crazy. This guy was bonkers. You know what? People are like, oh man. Some people are like, well, he got set up and he shouldn't be, you know what, dude? <laughs> he was a piece of shit. Let's say what he, he was. was. A piece he was of a shit. piece of shit. <laughs> he get these young guys. He probably get them hooked up on that fucking meth. They're all missing the teeth, and then then he's making straight guys. He's sleeping with them. He's making them the husband. I mean, he's a. And then I heard he treated all his employees like shit. He's a fucking idiot. He belongs in jail. You know. I mean, just because everybody else involves a piece of shit too, doesn't mean that uh, you know, this guy should get a pass. He, even if uh, I mean, dude, he's uh, dude, he's a fucking whack job. But it was entertaining as shit though. It was. It was super entertaining. You know? It, it's oh, amazing shit, how famous man. he is, and he's in jail. He can't even enjoy it. So it's crazy how, how ironic that is. Hey, man. Yeah, dude. I mean, uh, look at guys. It's, dude, it's, it's it's crazy, man. People make uh, they make bad choices, dude, and, and, and poor choices. And I look at that war machine. I don't know why I'm bringing him up. I brought him up earlier because I was – you know, you go through YouTube and things pop up. There was a thing on, like, the war machine situation – and I'm just like, man, dude, there's a part of me that that no, he I mean, listen, that guy, what he did was horrendous. And, I, you know, I, I got three daughters and and I like what he did was was inexcusable. But I remember him on season six of The Ultimate Fighter. And it, it, maybe it's before he went down the extreme dark path, you know, that partly that fame could bring you because he started to get more popular. And, you know, there's certain and, and I don't there was a certain. I don't know, man. Like, I feel if that guy was, like, around me and Lon, if he was around different people, he could have been, like, uh, brought a different direction. But I don't know. Yeah. That's just something I think about, you know, because I remember talking to him on the show, and there was, and, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not saying, obviously, what he did was fucking horrendous, and he belongs in jail. But yeah, there was yeah. something likable at, on the show. Was, I remember there was something, like, a likable about him. But I'm like, man, you know, I, you wanted to help him. But uh, that guy, I don't know. That guy just made some bad. I mean, that you know, that, it, it's just a shame. You know, it's like it's like a vulnerability. Like that, but, yeah. I think it's like a vulnerability. Yeah. Like I know somebody else that's like him that hasn't done something horrendous yet, 
but they have that same personality where they're just lost and they don't know what to do with their lives and they're very kind of vulnerable, which is what I think you saw. It's almost like you feel bad for them, but they're likely just to do something crazy. And I think he went that route where he lost his mind and went and did something really crazy and really stupid. And, and, and maybe he could have been saved if he had the right friends, you know, or the right person to lead him, but it didn't happen. And, and, and now he's obviously uh, in a worse position. Yeah, man. It's amazing, man. Like, you know, like, I mean, I'm wearing a, Henzo nose shirt and I, you know, I Henzo, think about man. like everybody loves Henzo and that's and that's and besides him being a, a a masterful fighter and teacher it's because of the person Henzo is is that's why I believe he has the success he is has you know as uh and you know um and you know you think about certain people that are put in your life and if they weren't there where would you be you know what I mean right. if it wasn't for me meeting Henzo as a kid and Henzo telling me to uh you know, he didn't like the way I was training because I was working all night at security and and uh, and just so I could train in Manhattan and then go back and do a security guard booth. And it was I was just tired and affecting my training. If it wasn't for Henzo was saying, dude, hey, hey, man, quit that job. Come here. Teach some jujitsu with me. And, I, and if he didn't do that for me, I mean, fuck, you know, but where would I be? You know, so yeah. it's amazing. So, I mean, it's it's like paying it forward and, you know all that type of thing. Like I try to do the same for my people that, that I come into contact with and I, I try to do underneath me with my students. And it, it, it's a positive thing and, and it, it gets set into motion by one person's good deeds and good actions. So it, it's wild, you know, and, and that's what I, you know, that's what I took from Henzo. Cause he didn't have to do that for me. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, nobody knew the name Sarah. I wasn't born into a, I mean, you know, I was just a, a kid with, I didn't, you know, I had nothing like really going for me besides I like doing jujitsu and I love jujitsu and that's it. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I don't know where I went with that, but you know, no, that's true. That's and what happens. The thing about, and the thing about with Henzo too, is like, he's, he is that good of a guy. You know what I mean? Like he, he, it's not a fake, yeah. uh, you know, attitude. It's not a fake thing he, he's a really good guy and so like i totally can see how he would just talk to you and be like hey man you know you come down to the to the studio like he, he's just such such a, such a real guy man I've, I've talked to him multiple times and and hung out with him on a few occasions and he's just such a genuinely nice guy and he has that heart you know that cares about people and you know a lot of fighters especially old school fighters have that you know because it's like when you come up yeah. that way and you fight for so long and you have that camaraderie with other guys that fight you have that that sympathy for other fighters and other guys and you have an ability to help them and 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 you want to do it because you know so so he's essentially the one that got you kind of into this whole thing and 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 pretty much got you to where your ufc level in fighting i guess huh yeah 100 percent. like i knew i knew at a I had a high school i mean first of all i got i, I graduated high school and i i got my i showed up at, i got my diploma but I, but the last few months was home, home uh, tutoring right. because of uh, incidents in high school, and I was never a bad kid. I always just had a temper and whatever else. And uh, I remember I was set to go into the Marines. You heard this story already? Or? No. Did you hear this? Or? Oh, okay. Well, I was set I, at seventeen. I was in the delay entry program. It's something that your parents have to sign to give you permission to go into like the Marines early type of thing. I knew right. I wasn't going to be a student, you know. Uh, it wasn't my thing. And at, at ni- in 1992, before there was a UFC, and if you thought you were a bad motherfucker, what do you do? You know what I mean? I, I wanted to uh, be a special forces guy. I wanted to be that dude. I'm like, well, those are the baddest motherfuckers. That's the route I'm going. And then, you know, lo and behold, I start, I, my, they, I had the recruiter come to my house. Uh, and a uh, nice little little hillbilly guy from down south. But he was he had an accent and a nice guy. And he, he sat with me and my parents. I saw in the papers. They saw in the papers. I was jogging with the, the Marines at the parks on the weekends, like the, the recruiting people. And, and I was looking forward to doing that because, you know, I needed a direction. And I saw what happened after high school with a lot of the local tough guys. It, they didn't end up well. They just, it, you know what I mean? The, the generation before me. And, uh, and again, like I said, there was no MMA, no UFC, nothing like that. So I remember that uh, I was 17. I didn't graduate yet. And uh, I got into a street fight uh, at the pizzeria I worked with when there was some guys coming up looking for me. I had a, I had a beef with a certain dude, and uh, he came up with a bunch of guys at my place of work. I used to deliver pizzas. I got into this fight. Long story short, 
I didn't know jujitsu. They they surrounded me. The guy had me in a headlock, cheek to cheek, like this. So I, I ended up biting his ear, took it off. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, I went to the, I went, to, and they, you know, they it got broken up. They obviously they they took him. The friends got him, took him to jail. My boss jumped in the fat piece of rear boss. My buddy, he's like, oh, you know, it was an even fight. They blasted him, broken nose. <laughs> I'm the only guy who didn't have nothing on me because they checked me out. I went tumbling into this. The, the parking lot, and they just picked him up. They picked the ear up. They took him to the hospital. The cops come. Dude, Mike, it was up. crazy. My, my parents were at a white a wedding. They had to come to the precinct uh, to see me, and I didn't get out. I had a rain the next morning, and uh, my father was a cop at that time. I remember him telling me, look, man, if something happens, press charges first. That way something's on there. And, and I remember being like, yo, man, this guy came to my place of business. I want to press charges. I didn't have no injuries, Mikey, so – they're like, hey, man, that's great, but this guy has no ear and a broken nose, so what the fuck? So they, they locked me up my first night. I had to spend the night in jail and, uh, you know, the holding thing. And and long – I'm making it a long story, but it's hard to leave some stuff out. I wasn't able – in 1992, like, because the original charge was a felony for disfigurement, they knocked it down to a uh, – I pleaded guilty to a, a misdemeanor, a class A misdemeanor of uh, something else. But it, and I got a youthful offender, and then he tried to f me civilly, and I got out of that because I was great on stand, and I told the truth. The guy came to my work, but I was no longer allowed to go into the service. My little recruiter, I remember, wow. he was a great guy. He goes, "Oh man, Matt, you know I got my bosses too, and I would love, I would be in a foxhole with you any day." The little, the little Georgia yeah. guy told me, "He goes, I'd be in a foxhole with you any day, but you know I got my superiors." So when that door closed for me. I'm like, all right, now I know I don't want to go to college because I barely got out of high school, but now I can't do what I wanted to do. I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to to do that military fucking Marine recon, and I, I, this is that, that's what I was gonna do. So what the fuck am I gonna do? And that and that summer, 1992, I graduated. I went with a buddy of mine to Waterbury, Connecticut, because I saw in Black Belt. You remember Black Belt magazine? Yeah, of course. Might have yeah, been absolutely. Yeah, like, no, no, no. The kids now. I, I, rem- no, no, I remember a full contact fighter newspaper magazine. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, that, of course. That's old man. school. So that's old Joel, school. Joel Gold, our guy who run that. Uh, yeah. Of course. Well, I remember in Black Belt magazine, it was a, um, oh, a seminar in Waterbury, Connecticut, and it was with Horion Gracie and Hoist Gracie. Now this is 1992, mm-hmm. so I'm like, oh shit, that's the the Gracie. That's from the in, the tapes of them fighting in action. Like I talked about it, we talked about earlier. I yeah. go, let me go do that, man. Let me go try that. I went there and uh, I took a lesson. And now before that, as you know, as being a martial artist, I did like Wing Chun Kung Fu. It's like, it was all fucking forms and shit like that. I'm like, yo, there's no forms. There's no katas. There's, it's all just about getting a, the position of mount. And that's where you strike. and Or else you're looking to break an arm. You're looking to strangle. I go, Holy fuck, this is what I need to do. This is it. This is what I – so I fell in love with it. But I thought I'd have to move to Cali, you know. And then Craig Kukuk, who was trained in Torrance in Brazil under the Gracies and then became Henzo's American business partner, moved to New Jersey, did one class a week in, in New York. And I started find, – I found out that was in a, a, a little judo fucking school in, 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 uh, in the village. So I'm like, yo, man – I went there once a week. I loved it. A couple years later, Henzo came. They had a fallen out. Henzo took me in. And now I'm talking to you, Mike Swick. So it is a crazy – If that's what I'm saying. So if you say about people coming into your life, it wasn't for that fucking idiot who came to, to beat me up. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd be, I'd be, I, I would have had a way different journey, man. So good or bad, sometimes things happen to you and doors get shut that you want open – but there's probably a reason they got shot, a bigger reason. Yeah. I'm getting deep yeah. now. But, I mean, listen, I mean, that's just, that's just, that no, was I, my No, I path, agree with you 100%. You know? I, I lost my first gym in Thailand, lost a lot of money, lost a lot of time, and completely failed. I mean, it couldn't have been more of a failure, and same thing. You know what I mean? Like, because of that, I was able to figure out all the things I did wrong and failed, and then I turned them around and built AK Thailand. And so, you know, the failure turned into, and more doors opened. And so that failure turned into now success. So, you know, yeah, I, I totally understand your point. And, and luckily, and, you know, I'll say this, I tell people this all the time, uh, that see me pursuing things and, and I'm very ambitious and I go after crazy stuff, but, um, 
you, you the doors never open if you stay still or you back away or you quit. You know what I mean? So my thing is always moving forward. Now, now sometimes I don't see the path completely. I don't see exactly how to get to where I'm going or what I'm trying to do. But I do know that if I make steps each day to get there and move forward, that's when these doors open that you don't expect and, and things happen and, and, and somebody joins you or you meet somebody and then they, they, they know somebody else and this, this, this thing happens. And so it's like I always tell people just move forward. You know, like, you know, you don't have to know exactly how you're going to do everything. But if you really want to do it and you're passionate about it and you think that you can do it, you, you know, you know, deep inside you can do it. Just go for it. And don't worry about how you're going to get all like I'm going to build this entire huge gym. that's two acres and and all these different things. Just worry about what you're going to do for the next day. Like, like I'm going to get the plans done by tomorrow. I'm going to approve those by the next day. You know, I'm going to sign the paperwork on the lease the next day, like baby steps. And then those things happen. And so I totally, I totally see what you're talking about. It's, 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 there's so many just circumstances that, and it makes you, it really makes you like me. It makes me just view like mishaps and shitty things that happen in life. Like you don't want to say, Oh, it happens for a reason. I'm not that guy. Right. But if it's a very big, if it's a bit like, look, man, I mean, there's so many fighting is the perfect example. My debut, Shoney Carter. I was, oh man, I, I feel I showed in UFC 31 with Shoney Carter. Nowadays, it's it's not like everybody sees this stuff now. But before then, nobody was doing Uma Plata's. Nobody was going for the legs to reversals. And I'm not bragging, but it was a an aggressive style of jujitsu that wasn't that common. Now it's very common. You know, but back then it wasn't. I'm not tooting my own horn, but I was fresh off of fucking Abu Dhabi. I was living on the mats and I, I brought that to the octagon and I had a, a great fight with Shoney. But then again, the lack of what we talked about earlier, my stand up and the timing. And I was just basically just street fighting, standing up. And I now if I watch that tape. I see the setup for these back fists like a mile away. It was always oh, so it was so silly. Me just rushing in only. The saying only fools rush in. I mean, I would just a straight line. No, it wasn't strategic at all. Not like my ground game. So, but if it wasn't for me losing in the last 15 seconds of that fight where, you know, it, I would never, you know what? I would have won. And then I would have fought Pat Militich. And that would have been too early for me to fight Pat Militich. If you right. ask me, like, because he fought Tony for Pat next and he lost the Pat at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. And I was there for that. Mm-hmm. I'm like, man, that would have been my fight. But you know what? I wasn't ready for Pat Militich then, I don't think. You know what I mean? In my 30s, I was a different fighter. Like, it's weird. When, and then, not for nothing, the way the universe works, I ended up getting Shoney Carter back in the house on the Ultimate Fighter. So there's times where shit could be like, yo, man, everything would be so right if I just did this in that fight. I would have won that fight and I would have. But no, maybe not. Maybe there's bigger things at work. And, and it you have to just... Not to, not to sound hippie-ish, but trust in the universe and let things – as long as you have good intentions and and, I, I, and and stay positive, that's the most important thing, things have a way of working out. Uh, that's just the way I think about things, you know? And that's just – I mean, I remember Carol Parisian, dude. I laid that guy out yeah. in the opening seconds of our fight. And, uh, you know, every fighting camp is different, you know what I mean? So – I remember, like I said, like I told you before, I had to really trust in my hands in that fight because I did a ton of boxing for that fight because I had a, a left knee thing. I'm not using it as an excuse. It just is what it is. And uh, I remember I almost laid him out. I, did, I, I rolled. I, I did a right. And a couple of things in that fight happened that if it wasn't for that, like I remember he went to – he was really on – he tried to get a hold of me, and that might not be politically correct to say. He was he was wobbly legs, uh, wobbly legs back then. So I remember I flipped him over when he tried to get a hold of me, but he was like propped up against the cage, or else I would have had a clean mount. And then he had a judo grip in the back of my fucking shorts, and he like a gorilla pulled himself in, and he weathered that shit. And then I started to gas, and he's the wrong guy to gas with. That's before he started running into issues. Yeah. That's back when he was the yeah. heat. And the guy oh, yeah. got me gassed. <laughs> and I made it. I remember I learned a lot about myself in that fight because it was one of those. It was the most hard I ever been in a fight. And between the second and third round, I took some damage on the floor. And I remember Ray asking me if I wanted to stop. And I and everything in your mind, of course you want to stop. You're fucking exhausted. You can't. I feel like I can't even stand. But I didn't quit. And that, that meant a lot to me. I got to show some cool escapes. And another thing. That fight, I remember it was the first fight my 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 fiance, now my wife of uh, twelve years, came to the fight with my my father in law, Ciro. It was the first time he watched me fight. They drove to Atlantic City and 
I remember being like, man, all my students were on the boardwalk. I remember going out afterwards going, hey, man, you fuckers better not go join a judo school after this and leave. You know what I mean? It was a horrible feeling. But he got, after that fight, he got to get matched up for a title versus Matt Hughes. And he tore his hamstring and then had issues, way issue, a lot of issues after that, and he fell off. If I would have won, I don't think, at the same time, I don't think I was ready for Matt Hughes at that time. I think I beat him when I fought him. Don't get me wrong. That fucking yeah. guy. But uh, is it too <laughs> soon since the accident? Anyway, he's better. No, Fuck that. Right. Anyway, Mikey, we're <laughs> shooting right. the shit. Listen. That's all right. I, don't, I, never, I never liked the guy. But I would have fought him too soon. I probably would have lost to the guy. And instead, I got put on that Ultimate Fighter show. Changed my life. So, Mikey, man... Just like this shit, every the world is going through now with this 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 virus. Me and you, kind of in limbo with our schools, everything we put our our lives into, up in the air. What's gonna happen? We gotta trust. We gotta trust in the in the way the universe works, buddy, because we're both good people, and this thing will clear, and and what we will come at, what will come out of it. Hopefully, not a bunch of debt. No, like is man. <laughs> I'm having, I'm, I'm really having such a great time with my family right now, and I will end up on my feet if my shit gets brought, uh, broken down. I will build it back up, and uh, it's important for everybody to keep a positive attitude. Otherwise, what do you got? You know what I mean? And these negative nillies, man. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's not going to do anything for you, man. Even if times are shit, you know. Even if you don't see an answer. You know, there's times with me, man, where I'm like, man, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I don't know how I'm going to pay for that. I don't know what. And then things have a way of working out. You know, kind of like that girl Domino in Deadpool. All right, see, that's my nerdy side coming out again. You know, yeah, I hear Deadpool that. I, I was, I was, I was going to say the same thing though, man. Like when when you came to to that conclusion with, about what we're dealing with right now, and it's positive positivity and baby steps. You know what I mean? Like it's just keep moving forward, keep positive, and And I think things are going to work out, you know? And and like you said, I've been through so much, I'm sure you have as well, like that it's like I'm not afraid to take a to take a hit, you know what I mean? Like I, like you said, if it, if, if it gets broken down, you're going to build it back up. I feel the same way. I, you know, I've struggled so much to build the, the first gym and it crashed, and then the second gym, and it's been a rough road. So I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of what's going to happen. And, and as bad as it can possibly get, I feel confident I will somehow figure out a way to build it back up and, and, and get where I need to go. So that's that positive attitude. And, and then just the baby steps moving forward, you know? Yeah. Maybe it's the fighter in us, but, uh, you gotta kind of welcome adversity. It kind of, it, it, you know what it does? It'll keep you up at night. It'll, you go to use the bathroom at five in the morning. Then you go back to sleep and your eyes open up. Start thinking of shit. And sometimes that's not a bad thing. Sometimes you got to use that as a, as a motivator to say, all right, I might have this door shut. I might have that door shut. What other doors can I open? What else can I do? That's why I'm getting on Twitch. <laughs> I am getting on fucking Twitch though. I'm a video game nerd and I'm a bad motherfucker in that VR. You, Mike, you see me with this thing on and I'm in that fucking thing and I'm, I, you ever play PUBG? <laughs> I'm you ever so play PUBG? Video games. Oh, well, no, let me tell you. I have no idea. Let me give you, let me give you the premise because you might, we might hang out in the Oasis. Here. You ever seen the movie Ready Player One? I know of the movie. Ready I, play I, I don't know if I saw Dude, it. Dude, such a good movie. It's based on a book. But it almost <laughs> gives you that 80s feel Spielberg type of movie. I think he, he did it, Spielberg. Or he had something to do with it, produced it. What a great movie. But it's basically like the future. of People like everything's so shitty in the future that people just hang out in their VR and whatever. It's that kind of too. thing. But, dude, I go in that thing. I have such a good time, man. I have a certain game I play. And picture this, Mikey. You start off your – you put the headset on. You're in, on a, like the wing of a plane, right? The plane's going. It's going over an island. And then you drop. And on this island, 30 players. There's some artificial intelligence. Not everybody's a human. Maybe 15 guys more or less. Other bots. The bots. But anyway, you got to find – you got to find a weapon or weapons. And then the perimeter – starts getting smaller and smaller now you got fucking houses forts it's not like Fortnite where you got to build shit it's like an island you got to go find weapons and you got to be the last man standing it's fucking awesome it's cool That's man I, anyway this is mikey's this is where i start to lose you this is like this is where you go you realize you're like you really are a man child 
<laughs> you're gonna have to text me on that. No, no, no. I'm, I've been interested in trying the VR because that's like the new thing, but I haven't yet. I have, I have no experience with that. I plan on getting on uh, Twitch. I, I've been saying it forever, and people are, are, are DMing me and telling me they want me to start it up. But my thing is, I'm doing this shit anyway, so might as well entertain and have a good time with that shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I hear you, man. I hear you. I was, I was going to ask hey, you, man. going back real real fast, though. Um, so, so you were a champion, and, and since you were a champion, I, I want to ask you specifically this. Do you feel like you, you were ahead of your time Uh and would you have rather been maybe 15 years younger now fighting where it's a lot different being a champion now than it, than it was then? Or do you think that guys like us, the old school guys, we, we, we had it as good as we, we should have had it back then and could have had it with how many fighters there were, the talent pool, the, the circumstances that around it. And are you content with that? Or would you, would you have rather been there today and, and fought the talent pool that we have today? And the, 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 obviously the, 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 way larger demographic of fighters no i mean i'm i'm proud of where i was um and and uh oh even before i got the i was content back when i was fighting when i had like a bat and i was like seven and seven but when i looked at i was just so psyched to uh to be fighting the best i was considered one of the best fighters on the planet i'm fighting the best i mean which i Again, it's not that I didn't have a goal of being a champion. When I when I first started in, in the martial arts, and my dream was like, all right, maybe I'll uh, I could get a school and I could have one of those challenge matches. Even before the UFC, maybe I could have a take where a guy comes and I don't want that shit now. I'll fucking sue somebody. I'll kill him. I don't want to get sued. <laughs> but my point is this: as a kid, I exceeded all my dreams. Like as far as that, like I didn't yeah. say, all right, I'm going to do this and be. A, there wasn't even a UFC, so it's like. I, I dreamed of having a school and doing that. So when I first opened my first storefront and I lived in the basement for like two years, it was going to be only a couple of months, but I was going to be between apartments and it was so comfortable. I would just, you know, and it's kind of cool at 26 years old doing that at 46, it might be depressing, but at 26, it was cool. And I remember just living in a, on this, in the, in the, like this little strip mall, like in the basement and waking up doing that. And I felt like then fighting in the UFC, I wasn't no millionaire. There's not a lot of money. But I would have a feeling like I made it back then. So you can imagine, yeah. you know. But as far as like like between now and then, like the popularity of the sport, I'm I'm very happy. Uh, people, a lot of times people know me now. I mean, the GSP fight was kind of huge where because of who George is, you know what I mean? That, that victory is, is the gift that keeps on giving type of thing. You know what I mean? Right. Because it was yeah, that sure. dog Rocky type movie. But a lot of people know me more now as Dana's looking for a fight with Dana and doing the podcast with Jimmy. They know me more for my personality than my fighting, which is kind of cool, you know? Yeah, the, So I'm the happy to, like that. I mean, you know, as far as fighting the talent then and now, I don't even see a difference in it. And then in other words, like I look at the guys I fought, BJ Penn, you know, yeah. even guys I don't like, like Matt Hughes, George St. Pierre. I mean, this guy's I fought, but Eve Edwards. I mean, this guy's had a bad motherfuckers that a lot of people don't even know. I mean, they know yeah. Eve Edwards, but I'm saying the fighters that do know. Let me ask you, Mikey, like, like I got this kind of other thing going, and it's nice that people recognize from that, and it gets a lot of views. Do you feel, and I, of course, listen, the people who know, know who Mike Swick is. You're, you know, a pioneer also. Do you feel you, 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 and you're still in the limelight, you're doing your shit, but do you feel like, you, you, if you were fighting now, like you, it'd be just obviously everything's more in the limelight now with everybody fighting. Like, you know what I mean? Like, do you feel you missed the boat a little bit with that or no? No. The popularity no. of fighting now compared to then? You know, the popularity is better, the money's better, the fame is better. But for me, you know, it was never my fighting was never my end game. Fighting was like I wanted to be a fighter. I wanted to be known as a fighter. I wanted to be successful where people knew who I was and 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 I had respect as a tough fighter, you know, and, and I could hold my own and yeah. be good guys. And then I wanted to move into something else. So for me personally, just being honest, I feel like I was in the right time because 
when I was coming up, I was on the Ultimate Fighter, which helped tremendously. Um, and then being off that ult- Ultimate Fighter, you know, I was on the main card of every fight. You know, there wasn't 500 fighters in the UFC. It wasn't overcrowded. So I got a lot of attention. I was on countdown shows. I had a lot of, you know, promotion and marketing. So, and I was fighting guys that were tough. They were very tough. You know, I fought Joe Riggs. You know, I fought Lawazo. I fought some tough guys. But nowadays, yeah. it's so hard. Like for me to have come up now, uh, I know guys in the UFC that are three and zero, four and zero, five and zero in the UFC, and you barely know their name. You know, when I was five and zero in the UFC, I was about to fight Anderson Silva, and I was a, a star. You know, in yeah. video games, magazine covers, and you know things like that. So, I think for me and my talent, where I was, the best I could have done was be in that time. I think I don't think I could have done as much now. And, and been any kind of uh, success now that I was then. So I, I humbly am happily happily yeah. in that time frame and, and, and now just trying to pursue something else, which is business and, and build these other dreams up. And, and because of that, and because I, 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 it was what it was back then, and I got to get a lot of boost um, that was a little easier to obtain, it's now carrying over. And I'm being able to milk that a little bit and utilize that to, to build up something that can last a little bit longer. And, I, mean, I mean, that's really what I recommend for most young fighters, too, is uh, it's good to want to be the champion. And, and of course, if that's their end game, they got to give everything to it. But you got to yeah, you, you have to think of or at least try to find another passion, you know, that you could yeah. that whether it has something to do with fighting or doesn't. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the, like most of my shit is. Like the fighting and then, you know, the other geek shit I just told you about. Like, I want to be able to make money through all that. That'd be fantastic. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, just like the video game thing, you know? So, but it's it's kind of unfair to be like, well, if I fought the talent today, would I have even stood out? Or it's hard to say that because everything evolves, whether it's boxing or fucking golf or every. Obviously, the, the, these guys grew up on MMA. When we were kids, we didn't, that was nothing. And when yeah. it first started, it was NHB, no holds barred. It was, it yeah. was nothing until now. It's really just mainstream, and kids grow up with it. They know. I mean, technically, my daughters know how to fight better now than I did when I was in high school. Tec- I mean, right. technically, yeah. I mean, it's a weird. It's, it's just the circle of life with that stuff. So, I am just very um, uh, appreciative to be uh, still in the limelight at all like uh, you know it's not like something yeah. like, i mean the podcast we were i remember we were doing the show the old the uh the dana uh dana white looking for a fight and we did a camping episode i remember being with dana and <laughs> dana's no camper he hates that shit he's funny mm-hmm. we have great episodes we had such a fun time but i remember bullshitting with him and we were we were outside and i don't know they were setting up something and he goes look do you want to try to do this podcast you want to do this podcast and he was throwing some names out and i'm like I don't know, man. I rather just I'm content to just doing my schools and and that's when we were doing the show a little bit more consistent. So I'm like, man, I'm, but these two gigs are fine with me, man. I like this and I don't know shit about fucking radio and I don't want to be the next Ariel Hawani or whatever. I don't. Yeah, yeah. And then he goes, nah. And then he brought up Jimmy Jim Norton and I always got along with Jimmy. Like I I didn't know him that well, but I did the uh, I did the old Opie and Anthony show, the radio show, the the classic radio show there in New York. And, and he was the, the, the third mic on there. And I met him there and I go, well, Jimmy's, I, I like Jimmy. He's a nice guy. And, and, I'm, and then I gave it a shot. And now I fucking love it. I yeah. well, Jimmy. I feel it's like family. I love my Jimmy. We're very close. We've been doing the show over three years, maybe close to four. And, uh, what a, what a good time. And people are enjoying it, which I think, I mean, the people hit me up, yeah, sure. whether I'm at Disneyland or whatever, they, a lot of people, they stop me there more for that than they do for my fighting, you know? Well, I mean, sometimes it's the George thing, but you know, it's wild, man. Again, I'm a, I'm a lucky dude. I'm not saying I ain't talented, yeah. but I'm saying, uh, I'm, uh, no, I'm, 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 I feel like I, I always feel like, uh, I stepped in shit, you know, in a good way, obviously. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Well, well, this is the quarantine special, so I have to ask you, and, and you see me wearing my New York hat today, and, and New York's taking a huge hit right now. And I, was, I really want to talk to you because you're in New York, and 
I, I don't know if you're familiar with the stats, but uh, as of, I have them here, but as of uh, today, there's been 710,000 cases in the U.S. I mean, this has blown up like like crazy every day, over 2,500 deaths a day, pretty much. Um, and there's been almost as many deaths in New York as in, or I'm sorry, half the deaths have almost been in New York of the whole United States. Like, it's crazy. It's like it's something, 14,500 of the deaths were in New York out of 37,000 in the U.S. So New York's obviously taken a huge hit. And I wanted to get your, um, kind of your input on what it's like being in New York, because I have to assume from the news I'm seeing here, and it's all New York, New York, New York, it's got to be crazy there. It's got, I mean, do you know people that have this coronavirus? Is it all over the news? Like, is is it as crazy yeah, for my you wife, being there as it is for me my, watching? Yeah. yeah, my wife lost her aunt. I mean, her aunt was 90 and smoked cigarettes, so it's a pretty good run as it is. But she caught the virus. She died. So, I mean, oh, that wow. was pretty close. My buddy Ray Longo has friends that he knows or acquaintances. Oh, wow. He goes, oh, man, this guy, that guy. So it gets real when you start – knowing people that are dying so it's like whoa yeah you know what i mean i have several uh friends that uh and uh a couple of them had it you know not people at my school or anything but uh uh through high school or whatever and this one it's it's scary i feel not that it's not in long island but i'm in long island it's a little more spread out i'd be on the train a couple of days a week going into the city to do the podcast not anymore. Now I'm doing it exactly the way we're doing this now. Uh, they yeah. said the UFC is good enough to send me a microphone and we're doing it like this. But uh, up until they stopped, I was going into the city too, twice a week. And I look forward to it. I loved it. I loved going to Penn Station, walking over to, uh, you know, the, the, the it was only like seven blocks away, hang out with Jimmy. I go back. I'm more on the trains than I am in the, 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 stu- the shows an hour long. It was, it was nice. It would break up the week nice, you know. But, uh, you know, I was starting to get worried too. Like, wait, I think in the city, it's so populated and everybody's on top of each other. Yeah. That's what happened. But I think Long Island is uh, a little better, obviously, for that reason. It's, everything's more spread out, you know. Me and my kids, one of the first thing I did is I hit Brand's bike shop was famous bike shop bike shop in my in my uh town it's been around for like 90 years i went there i got a mountain bike i got my my kids new bikes and we do like uh family bike rides and it's funny man it feels like it feels like you're in walking dead going for a fucking supply run (laughs) yeah we're fucking going around town and it's everything's closed down but uh again that's pretty much it man a lot of family time and uh just an uncertain thing in the future for my schools when we get off the phone after this, I have to get the Skype. I'm going to go check my bank and see if the I'm getting those fucking loans. You know, yeah. Crazy times, Mikey. It's it. Thank you, man. It's it's crazy times, but we're all in this together, and uh, it's important, like we said, to stay positive. You know, yeah. Negative minds not to help anything. For sure, absolutely, man. And and so California has this like shelter in place kind of thing where you have to kind of stay home. We're obviously locked down, like like America will never be. Um, is there anything in place where you're at? Like, are you are you wearing a mask when you go outside, or are you kind of just staying around your family and not around other people? Or is there like actually mandates stating that you have to do certain things? Like, what is it like where you're at right now? They're saying that you have to wear the mask now. It's just like from the, the last few days. They're saying that if not in your car, but if you're outside, I think as far as like in the public. But when we went for our bike rides, we're by ourselves. Like there's nobody around. Right, so it's not like I'm going to a bike trail with a lot of people and it's around town. Nobody's near us. It's like a ghost town. So I'm not I'm not doing that because I'm not going to be able to fucking breathe. But uh, yeah. we're not going near people. And, you know, we do that when the weather's nice and we don't go near anybody. There's no play dates with the kids or anything like that. And that's it, man. The Sarah's are just holding tight at the house. Uno games, uh, staying up late, watching movies. And uh, it's nice to, you know, be with the family. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, I, I, but I'll tell you, man, if you're not squared away with that, I heard there's a lot. I heard, I ever hear reports of domestic abuse going up. Yeah. And I heard in China, there's rumors. I said, I don't know if it's true, but I heard once this thing, once they got like let out of quarantine, there's a lot of divorces. <laughs> yeah. It's oh, I crazy, can imagine. Right? I can imagine. But we're, 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 listen, we're, we're chill over here, man. So, you know, we get along, you know, me and my wife get along great. And, uh, and my kids are just too funny. So we're having a good time at the Sarah house, you know? Do you think, do you think we're going to be able to recover from this? I mean, do you think, 
this is going to change the way we greet people and and or as close and and affectionate to people like shaking hands and hugging and all that do you think this is going to have an effect on that and do you think this is going to have an effect on uh sporting events and concerts and things like that where uh, people are going to be in the future afraid to be in groups, and 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 masks might be a a common thing. I mean, do you think that's going to happen, or do you think that's once this is over, people I, are just going to go back to normal? Whether oh, you there, buddy? Yeah, I got you. You got you? Okay, sorry. Yep. I the mic. Listen, no whether it's in the upcoming months or or longer, if things are going to have to get, I mean, what are we never going to? That's going to be the culture now. This is the new normal. That's what everybody's saying. I don't want to like, I don't like that world. I don't want to. Yeah. And it's not just because I'm in the business of strangling people of my schools. I, <laughs> I love jujitsu, man. I like, uh, and I don't, and like we talked earlier, I don't have fighter schools. I have a fight team that I mean, my fight team, like me and Longo, we have a beautiful thing where, you know, we have a fight team under us. So I have the best of both worlds. You know what I mean? Yeah. I got a fight team. But I also have purely Brazilian jiu-jitsu schools. My biggest Damn. thing is not – my biggest thing with my schools is what I really love is – and it gets a little corny, but I like to empower – it sounds it sounds like I have a comic book and I'm a comic book guy. <laughs> but I do like to empower – I do like to empower the weak. In jiu-jitsu, I was yeah. this close when I started putting my money into my big schools – like they're both over twelve thousand square feet here, and it's expensive in Long Island. I remember I had I was gonna have a big thing, Sarah MMA on the strip. It's gonna be big on top of my 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 neon sign, and I had Christmas cards come up with that shit. And I was gonna and I I stopped last second. I went back to Sarah BJJ because it's I, I mean don't get me wrong I I'll watch MMA way before I'll watch any jujitsu matches. I just love and I love doing jujitsu more than MMA, but it's more I love jujitsu for the fighting. But my point is this. It's a different clientele. You don't want a fighter gym, or you maybe you do. But if you do, I hope you have another source of income because all fighters are fucking broke, and it's so that's you know what I mean. It's hard to to just yeah. cater to that audience. Everybody wants to be the next champ. Nobody's got money for anything. What jujitsu? You have a different clientele: doctors, lawyers, firemen, police, all, all walks of life, students, everybody, and not any. And there's a portion that want to be fighters and that's great like i have the fight team for that but if and, and i'm not trying to bring this up because it went fucking viral but if you ever seen the thing with me in 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 vegas when i was uh with that drunk that that started that shit in the cafe i don't know if you ever seen you it if fight. not you can put put it put it matt fight? server was drunk well i had to just control a guy basically it wasn't much I of a fight I, but, I it show, but it that. shows you that dude, that thing went viral more than anything and uh it did great for my schools but the point is this I was with my family. Next day, I'm going to the UFC Hall of Fame. We're at, a, at the Red Rock Casino. A drunk idiot, out of his mind, started with the waiters, starting getting rowdy, became a problem. I had to control it with jujitsu. That motherfucker did not care. And I don't look like a pussy. And that guy did not care. He was so drunk, out of control. If I put my, I, I think of all my students, like if it was one of my students that was not. I mean, I, I mean, listen, I'm not the tallest guy, but I kind of look like a, a fucking pit bull. So, I mean, for that guy to fuck with me in front of my wife and kids, if yeah. I did not know how to handle myself, I put one of my students in that same situation. If this guy's got the balls to do this in front of me, to me, to try to do this, imagine if I couldn't control, imagine, forget about winning championships, imagine if I could not handle myself, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh and I get I get beat up in front of my wife and kids. That's something that people might not ever live down. And I put my students, everybody, I, all my students, I think of if they were in that same exact position that I was in, the fact that they could neutralize that situation, not only would I mean, dude, I could have neutralized it with an elbow or a right hand too, Mikey. But I hit him. His head hits the floor. It's a problem. My kids are there. They get scarred. I gave this guy a jiu-jitsu lesson, didn't have to throw a punch, I told my sister to tape it so I didn't get sued. It ended up going viral. Fuck, it was on TMZ and everything else. So it was, it was it, my biggest thing with my schools is that I get to empower people like, like the way I had that ability just to neutralize that. Handle. They will have that same ability. They might not become another, they might not have a fight in their life, a UFC fight, yeah. an MMA fight, but you don't choose when a problem is going to find you and this fucking no, this douchebag, there was the second we started, I, I got up cause he was going to go after my waiter. He put all the attention on me. You got a fucking problem. 
Second that shirt was coming off, it, there's no, hey man, no, what are you going to do? You got to know yeah. how to neutralize shit. So the fact yeah. that I can empower, I don't want to stop doing that. I don't want to start, I mean, I, I like making a living of empowering people with this beautiful art, you know? I mean, so a little corny, but it's what I like no, to I hear do you. and it's what I want to continue. I want to continue doing it. You know what I mean? I seen people not only lose weight, but just this, they get a, they get a swag, man. They get a different way of carrying themselves, not cocky, but confident because they know if something does occur, you know, they're controlling guys that know how to get out of situations. They're getting out of positions with guys who know how to control them. It gives them a confidence that, that, they would never have if they didn't walk through my doors. So I want to I want to do that for another 20 years. So this shit better get better, you, Mikey. You know? I'm with you, you know? too. And it's not. It's, it's even a step different for me because it's not just about people coming. I'm a destination gym. So it's not just about people coming and being able to learn to defend themselves like, you know, your, your guests because – or your, I'm sorry, your students because they're there every day. But mine's also like an, an experience. You know, they're, they're – you know, accountants yeah, and lawyers they're coming and they're training with muay thai trainers so they may not even get that much better in the week that they're here or the two weeks or whatever but it's a fun experience and it changes them as a person you know it changes them as like you know it's the confidence and the excitement and the so it's like yeah i'm the same as you man it's like the majority of our our guests at ak thailand are not fighters and, and they, they have no intention of being fighters some want to learn to defend themselves like like what you were saying and others are here for the experience they want to they want to experience something cool and train with world champion muay thai trainers outside in the jungle with the with the air blowing on them and you know and, and experience this kind of cool 100%. stuff so i'm i'm with you man I, I want this to keep going and i hope this doesn't have any kind of effect on the future of that um and and i guess in the meantime until we get over this whole thing uh, dana white's doing this fight island i have to ask you because you're yes. friends with dana and obviously what, do you, what what is your take on this fight island being like the temporary fix until this is all over with like what, what's your take on fight island i fucking love it man i recommend uh that they should get joe <laughs> silva they bring him back as fucking tattoo and make him the only fc fantasy island with the plane the plane have that little motherfucker yeah. come back yeah, Joe Silva <laughs> looks just like that little fuck. But anyway, uh, I like it. I think it sounds something straight out of Enter the Dragon, Hans uh, fucking island. But I do, I like it, man. I mean, it sounds wild. It really does, you know? And uh, I know they said that that's for international fighters. But my thing was, they're not going to just keep fighting international versus international. So American fighters got to fight there also. I, yeah. I know, to tell you the truth, I know about as much as you do. I don't, it's, it's yeah. very new. And, uh, but I, and I'm not looking for information. Sound. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I wasn't looking for information. I know your friends with Dana too, but I was, I was just getting your idea, like your, like your thoughts on it. And, and if you thought it was a good idea, that was it. Yeah, I'm getting people's opinion on that. And it sounds cool, man. It sounds like, like what you said, like this, this crazy, uh, like fantasy Island, but for fighters where, you know, it, it, I don't know hey, where it is and, and I, how it's going to be yeah. set up, but it, I know if Dana's behind it and he's as excited as he sounds when he's doing these pressers, it's going to have to be, very interesting to say the least. So, uh, I'm I'm curious. Hey, I'll, I I might know more, you know, soon. Uh, Dan is dropping hints of doing a looking for a fight on that thing. So or That'd something, you know, what I'm saying. So I would love that, you know, because that's that, that's so cool. Again, man. like we spoke about before, that Dana White looking for a fight on YouTube. It's uh it's such a great gig. So that's another thing that I'm looking forward to doing again. We just gotta uh, we just gotta dig in deep, man, and just be there for the for the rest of uh you know, be there for each other in this time. You're lucky, man, because you got this. This is you're good at this. You should keep running with this, buddy. You're a good man, podcast. I'm, I'm I'm an amateur next to you, bro. You're killing me right now. You're killing me right now. Oh, I, man. I've never I've, I've never I've never had such a I've never had such a pro that I've had on my podcast. So like I'm 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 stumbling trying to just keep up with you, man, and like and trying to hold oh. my own over here. So. Oh, you're no, great, but, man. I think we're, how, how long have we been talking for now, Mikey? An hour and 40 minutes. Hour and 40 an minutes. Hour and 40 minutes? What is this? Yeah. The, what is it? You're doing the, the Joe Rogan experience? <laughs> I, I think so, man. I, I guess. I, you're, you're just so natural, good, man. You just, hey, listen. My, my podcasts are, uh, are usually an hour. So you're, you're, you're doing way better. Listen. And I got Jimmy Bird to do the heavy lifting. So you you did fucking <laughs> awesome, man. I, I, had a, well, well, I had a great time talking to you, man. And... Uh, uh, and listen, if you want me on again, anything else you want to bullshit about before I get out? I mean, talk to me. I, I want to, first I want to appreciate, 
yeah, first I want to thank you for your time, man, because again, an hour, 40 minutes. I appreciate that. And I love talking to you and this is great. Uh, this will be my longest podcast and I, and I, I greatly appreciate you know, that. Um, but, but you know before funny, I Mike, let you, Mike, you did say we were going to do 20 minutes, but we're just, I, we got nothing to do. We're in quarantine. <laughs> Yeah, that's why it's a quarantine series because I can get guests so easy now because everybody's at home. So it's like, it's the best time to do exactly. Skypes with people. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I appreciate your, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I appreciate your time, man. I appreciate you coming in here. But while I have you here, such a professional at what you do, I want to get you to break down one fight for me. Uh, actually, I wanted you to break down Khabib versus Ferguson. Um, but then now it seems like Gaethje versus Ferguson might be the one happening if this fight island happens. Um, could you possibly give me your your take on those two fights uh, being that they're probably both going to happen eventually anyway, but Khabib versus Ferguson and Ferguson versus Gaethje? Just one good breakdown from you before I, before I let I you go. Am, well, this is, I mean, I am a huge Habib fan. I love Habib. Yeah. I go by the nickname Kamora Savage on my VR. I love the fucking Kamoras. <laughs> I think Habib is is like, I, I love the way he carries himself. I am a Habib fan. Now, Habib is Tony. I'm a Tony Ferguson. Tony Ferguson is a nightmare for several, uh, to, to face for several reasons. Endurance, a, a wide skill set of just extremely well-rounded, and perhaps most importantly is his mentality. Like when he fought Kevin Lee, I, I remember pointing out that Kevin Lee mounted him. And, you know, other guys could feel defeated by that. It did not make a difference when he got out. It's like he never been mounted. That's the that's the sign of a guy that there's some guys that have a certain point to get pushed until they break, and you gotta just. Uh, there's other guys that there's like there's an off switch. You have unless that switch is off, they're gonna keep coming after you, and that's Tony Ferguson. So that's what made that fight so intriguing. Could he survive the mauling of Habib? I feel, and again, I love Tony. So I mean, Tony's a dog. I feel at once at a certain point, I feel Habib will get that on behind his back, and maybe I don't think that he'd want to quit. But I think I, I I I feel that Habib is such a master at controlling on the floor positionally. So between the ground and pound, I think. It, it, but it would ultimately be a finish by Kimura or something where it'd have to just break Frank Mir Minotauro style. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's how yeah. I see that kind of thing going. But I would love to see it. I would be even more intrigued. It's, I'm even more fascinated at Justin Gaethje versus Habib. And the reason I say that, in his whole career, unless he just chose to go with it and chill, I, I see that maybe one of his fights, uh, Justin doesn't go to his, the guard. He doesn't go get taken down. His wrestling is so good. He uses it not to take guys down, but to stay up. So, and he is a fucking powerhouse striker where he's his, from his kicks that are devastating to his KO power when he's been knocking these guys out. His last three fights versus James Vick. Don't say it. James Vick, Edson Barboza, and James Vick, Edson Barboza. Who the fuck am I forgetting? God damn it. I, I, I'm lost too. I'm anyway, lost too. it's Three, I'm, I'm going to bother the shit out of me, and I don't want to disrespect mm. but somebody and not mention it. James Vicky knocked out. Uh, Edson yeah. Barbosa, he stopped. And Cowboy, Cerrone, you're, he stopped. No, 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 you're talking about, right. yeah, his last fight, he knocked out uh, his Gage. friend, Cerrone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Justin Gage. Okay, there you go. He, he, I'm not as shot as He knocked as out thought. Cerrone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then he felt uh, bad afterwards because I let the fight keep going. He's never looked better, Justin Gagey. And I would, and talk about styles. Can Habib... Get him down and do to him and keep him down. Because when he gets back up, he's bringing hell. Because another thing that Justin Gage has is like what Tony has is the endurance factor. And mm -hmm. and not for nothing, let's not forget that Habib has heavy hands. He dropped Connor. He just doesn't rely on it because he doesn't have to. So right. I find the Justin Gage fight even more. If it wasn't for the buildup of five fights that got canceled with Tony Ferguson and Habib, 
Style-wise, I feel Habib and and uh, Justin Gaethje is even more intriguing for me. I think it's even more of a, whoa, could he do what he does to everybody else to Justin Gaethje? Because Justin, Ga- Justin Gaethje's number one thing is he likes to stand, but he's got a stud wrestling background, and nobody's ever ground and pounded this dude. He's getting taken out standing yeah. up. Would Habib do that? Dude, I can go on and on. That fight fascinates me. I, I'd rather see it, to be honest with you. I'd rather yeah, see him fight the- Justin I wanted you to break down the, the Ferguson Gaethje just in case that happens because that was the one that was announced. Just in case that does happen in the meantime at Fight Island if, or whenever this happens, if it gets uh, to take place. Um, but going back to that, I think the the because I'm teammates with Khabib, obviously, so I'm biased, but I'm also a huge fan and I know how dangerous he is and I know how strong he is from grappling with him. Um, but yes. to me, I am more worried about Khabib in a Gaethje fight than I am a Ferguson fight just for the fact of how how Gaethje swings and how how you know the fight does start on the feet each time each round and Gaethje's yeah. such a freaking animal with his hands and just doesn't care and if he catches one of those you know it, it's going to change things so that that fight worries me a little bit more than the Ferguson fight with with Khabib but I wanted to get your your opinion also of just if this fight does go through somehow with Gaethje versus Ferguson because that's an interesting matchup what do you think there? I, you know what? We just talked to Justin recently, and uh, I feel it would probably go one of two ways. I think that Justin would either knock him out or uh, Gaethje might get strangled in the later rounds. That that might that that that, that you know he's good with the uh, with the arm strangles, you know, and uh, off shots and whatnot, and 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 off the the, the front headlock and. I feel that uh, that and, and even uh, you know it's funny that's two of the ways that Justin was saying that and, I, and Justin was saying he didn't have really a, a good camp like, like a, a full camp so he's saying that you know he'd be fine with either finishing it early but him knocking him out or him getting strangled later in the rounds. So I, 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 what I love about Justin Gaethje is he uh, he he commits fully he leaves it all out there and the outcome is the outcome. He's not a crybaby when he loses. He's like, man, that was a good fight. I remember he was doing a, uh, he lost, the, uh, it was Poirier maybe. And and I remember, he's like, why does everybody look so down? He's snacking, he's, he's talking to the reporters after, right, doing the post-fight thing. Like, what's up, everybody? Why all the long faces? Because he knows he gave it 110%. And it's a very freeing feeling. And it, similar to when I fought GSP, not, not to fucking <laughs> bring that up. But I remember walking to the cage to fight George with a feeling, kind of how Justin probably had, feels every time he fights, the way he talks is, I remember going to fight George with, uh, okay, it's a him or me attitude. I'm either going to, I don't know, because I remember seeing uh, Tim Sylvia versus Jeff Munson. And it was a fight, yeah. like a, 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 a title fight. And it was Justin shooting for, uh, uh, not Justin, uh, what the fuck's his name? I just said it. Uh, Jeff Munson shooting from a course. Yeah, oh, Tim Sylvia, that big dork. He would be, I never liked him. He'd be, he'd sprawl. sprawl and, and, and then uh, Jeff Munson would be shooting from a course. Right now. It went five rounds. It was the shittiest fight ever. So forgettable. So I remember thinking, going to the fight with George, like, ah, oh, man, this is very freeing because one, it's not going to be boring. It's either me or him. He doesn't know that I plan on standing. Don't get me wrong, if he slips, I'll jump on mount. But fuck it. I remember planning on just <laughs> and it's a very freeing feeling. So I could imagine that's how Justin feels in every fight. And it's a great it's a great yeah. feeling to have. You know what I mean? Yeah, of just of hey man, I I did everything I can. Let's let the chips fall where they may, you know? Yeah. All right, man. That's that's I won't take any more of your time, man. We didn't we did a uh, hour and fifteen <laughs> minutes, so that I really fun. appreciate it, man. Hey, yeah, thank man, you so no much problem. for coming on the show. Dude, problem man uh you return the favor you come on ufc unfiltered soon for all your listeners uh check me out on instagram matt sarah bjj and uh, that's it man check out dana white looking for a fight check out my podcast and we'll be back mike swick we'll be back buddy i'd love to come on your show and we'll link everything at the bottom of the description of this video so uh thanks again man i really appreciate it it's always great talking to you i've never talked to you for two hours before and and as long as i've known you but it's been great man. i've loved this conversation this is and especially in quarantine right now to be able to sit and talk to you about our history and about our careers and and all this stuff it's been it's been great for me and i, I think everyone else is going to enjoy it too
We covered a lot, man. Let me know when you're doing the 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 putting out the promotion for this. Send me some clips, and I'll do it on my Instagram. You got it. All right, Mike. You got it, man. Take care, man. Thanks for having me, bro. Hey, thank you so much, Matt. Take care, buddy. All right, so there you have it, Matt Sarah. What a great podcast. Uh, almost two hour podcast. My longest. A, a record now for my longest podcast and of course it's no surprise that it's from a professional podcaster so hopefully i held my own um that was a good test for me to talk to somebody that was uh so good at this and uh it was a great conversation i love matt sarah we've always had a great time uh throughout our careers and and you know i've never talked to him for this long so it, it's it was great reminiscing and finding out a lot of things about matt sarah that i didn't know and uh, i think he found out a lot of things he didn't know as well but uh, anyway, he has a great podcast with Jim Norton called UFC Unfiltered. We're going to put all the information in the description below. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're w listening to us on the audio platforms, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, please subscribe to us there. This is the sixth podcast we've done in a week. We've had Tyron. We've had Michelle Watterson. We've had Forrest Griffin. We've had Rampage Jackson. We've had Chuck Liddell, who's going to be posted in the next day or so, which actually, now that you're watching this, it was already posted. Um, and then now Matt Sarah. So this is six podcasts in a week. We're going to keep these going. we got a lot of great guests lined up. So stay tuned. <laughs>